Hello and welcome to Psyched, the show where we explore psychedelics through social, economic, and political perspectives. Our next speakers are Tanya Schoman and Niels von Heine. Um, they will be talking on psychoactivating system change, upgrading leadership, innovation, and systems through psychedelics and other psychoactive technologies. Dr. Tanya Schoman is the CEO and co-founder of PsyX, the systemic psychedelic, which is psychoactivating system change. PsyX is the world's first platform to future fit leadership, innovation, and global system solutions through the rigorous and purposeful application of science-backed psychoactive technologies. Uh, for example, exogenous psychedelics and uh, endogenous breathwork. PsyX thereby also acts as a bridge between the psychedelic renaissance and the fourth industrial revolution to synergize solutions for complex global challenges at the self, sector, and eco-societal dimensions. Tanya and Niels, thank you for joining us and welcome to Psyched. Yeah, thank you very much for having us. Um, I'm wondering, just to double check right now, I'm on the screen and Niels will be um, on the screen later, right? Yes, you are on the okay. screen. Whoever talks uh, will be on the screen. Okay, perfect. Yeah, um, like Marek said, it's going to be Niels and I presenting. And I'm going to start and Niels will then um, share the second half of the talk. And yeah, first of all, um, I really want to give a big, big shout out to Marek and the team for organizing this. And um, yeah, I really had very positive experiences with you guys so far and very grateful for your work. So I wanted to, um, yeah, to just express my gratitude. Thank um, you. Yeah, so let me um, share my presentation. Is that now visible for everybody? Yep, you're good. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, let me get started. Um, yeah, first a few words on myself. Like Marek said, I'm um, Tanya Schumann. I'm the co-founder and CEO of SciX. And my professional work at the moment is all about what we call psychoactivating system change. And yeah, first I should maybe say a word on the terminology um, because oh, psychoactivating is not really how normally people talk about psychoactives psychedelics. And we chose that term um, in our communication because we want to highlight that we're not just talking about psychedelics, but really about all sorts of psychoactive um, modalities. So there's both the endogenous, so meaning breath work and meditation, so ways where you don't actually take any substances, but then also psychedelics or things like neurostimulation that are basically exogenous and um, triggering the state of consciousness from the outside. And yeah, I actually had some warm up questions because I thought that everybody would be visible how it's sometimes in these kind of online conferences that you can see other people on the screen, but maybe then people can just have a thought about the questions. And it's, um, I mean, first of all, whether you have any psychoactive or psychedelic experiences in the first place. And if you do have, then the question is, well, have you experienced any shift in how you see your profession and your impact in the outer world? because that's really what we're, we're talking about in our work, about this um, shift that's happening beyond just the personal transformation, but how people change also in relation to their work and the mission that they see um, that they have in the world at large. And yeah, now I would like to move a bit to my personal background to give some, some idea of why we came up with the work that we do. So, um, I initially did a PhD in social psychology um, at Cambridge. And as part of my PhD, I was working on several tech related projects. And I was working, for example, with IBM down in Kenya on um, working on e-health solutions for nurses and um, coming up with, with e-learning for them. And also working in Nigeria um, with another tech company and developing vaccination delivery tools and then moved towards being really inspired by working in that field and um, experiencing what are the, really the biggest challenges 
in the world outside of Germany, where I'm from. Um, I got really, really passionate about that and then joined the, broadly speaking, the social impact space and worked a lot with social entrepreneurs um, pretty much all over the place. So did some work in the Middle East and then um, also in Afghanistan and Pakistan and in various other African countries. And um, what that really taught me was to, to get a better understanding of global challenges and how everything is really interrelated. And just to give you a bit of an overview of what I mean by global challenges, I have here like a list of um, like clusters of global challenges. I mean, so first of all, you have um, the ecosystemic crisis that we're facing at the moment, where humanity is really threatened by um, environmental degradation and biodiversity loss. And then you also have social and economic complexities where, um, I mean, when we look at, for example, trade negotiations and other um, inter-country um, conflicts that are arising. And then lastly, there's also technological progress, which also is in some sense a global challenge. Um, because on the one hand, it does offer a lot of solutions, but then also a lot of threats. I mean, that starts from, um, from privacy issues, but then also things like automated weapons, if you take it to the, to the extreme. And there's a great quote by Albert Einstein, who said, um, the perfection of means and the confusion of ends seems to be our problem. And that's really speaking to the moral compass that you need when, when you're at, um, at the forefront of technological innovation. And I'm aware that probably some people aren't so active in the social impact space. So also just to give an overview of ways to familiarize yourself with these challenges and to um, also you know, go a bit beyond the more polarizing reports that you get in the news. So some ways of, of framing these issues are, for example, the um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are um, a number 17 goals that are talking to um, the most pressing challenges that we're facing. So there are things from um, um, reduced inequalities to, um, to environmental issues, to education and such. And then you also have the World Economic Forum Global Risk Map, which is pretty eye-opening because you can also, they have a mapping also of the, how the risks changed throughout the past decade or so. And it's quite fascinating to see how, how the situation changed. Um, another relatively famous model is the donut model of planetary boundaries, which is talking to the various resources that we have on the planet and that we need to take care of in order to maintain the, the earth as a habitable place for humans. Now, um, what I realized as I was working in that field relates to another quote also by Albert Einstein, which says, we cannot solve our problems with the same level of thinking that created them. And the insight came to me um, to a large extent because of the, the background that I have in spiritual practices. And that started when I was pretty young. So I think around 15, when I started to do meditation fairly regularly and had a regular yogic practice, um, and then also started to work with psychedelics and shamanism some, I think, four years ago. And what I noticed then working in that field of um, social impact was that I felt that most of the challenges aren't so much about, about having too few re resources or um, not having the means to solve the problems, but it was really about problems of, um, of mindset and of the level of consciousness from which we operate. And I mean, those can be small things like, you know, people being competitive even within organizations and by that not reaching the full potential of that individual organization. Or it can be things like organizations being competitive against each other instead of partnering up and reach a, a reaching global, um, wider, wider impact. And that then um, kind of brings me to, to the intersection of the psychedelic renaissance and the fourth industrial revolution. Because um, if you think about the psychedelic renaissance and also people in spiritual circles, pretty much all of them have quite a large awareness or um, they, they care for the environment, they care for social um, justice issues. But the level to which that's really addressed in those communities to, in a, let's say, systemic and proactive way is not really at its best. So what I mean by that is, for example, if you go to most of the psychedelic conferences, the talks are mainly focused on mental health issues, on um, things like depression and addictions, 
and to some extent also anthropology and um, looking into the cultural aspects of psychedelics. But there's very, very rarely any talk where, for example, also people from the space of business or innovation are invited to share how, um, for example, in, in their journey, psychedelics and other psychoactive technologies have had an impact on their, their work and have perhaps changed their moral compass. And at the same time, then you have the industrial revolution where a lot of people, you know, like in the global impact space um, are coming up with, with great ideas to solve challenges. But then often, like I said, not really from the right mindset or the right, um, yeah, the right level of consciousness really to, to get to the, the best outcomes. And what then happened was that last year, I essentially quit my, my former job or I, I stopped working in my own former um, business um, as I was self-employed and got together with my co-founder and we brainstormed on how can we how can we address that topic and how can we make a difference and really bridge these two worlds and that led us to to found SciEx which is an organization that really has the aim of bridging that divide of the outer change and leadership innovation and systems and the work that's being done in spiritual and psychedelic circles. And um, yeah, so the, the key areas of focus that we have are leadership, innovation, and systems. Um, and we chose those for various reasons. I mean, largely because we think that those are really the key nodes of power and um, the catalysts of, of social change. And I mean, what's wrong with leadership is nicely summarized by a quote from Professor Barbara Kellerman who's, um, she's at the JFK School of Government at Harvard. So, you know, somebody with, with quite a reputation in the field. And she was saying that um, despite the enormous sums of money and time that have been poured into trying to teach people how to lead, over its roughly 40 year history, the leadership industry has not in any major, meaningful, measurable way improved the human condition. I'm growing more doubtful about this fixational leadership with every passing day. So what she's saying is that so many people are looking into how to improve leadership, but the really disruptive change is not happening. And that's where we see that psychedelics and developing leadership programs um, with a psychedelic component can really make a difference. Then um, in relation to innovation, I mean, I already mentioned that one quote by Albert Einstein. There's another one um, by Martin Luther King who said, when scientific power outruns moral power, we end up with guided missiles and misguided men that then again speaks to the, the fact that we need, we need the right moral compass in order to really come up with the best innovations. And innovations that really serve humanity and aren't just the wildest dream of the programmer, but really have, um, have an impact. And then, yeah, in terms of systems, I mean, you can look at it from various angles, but um, even if you take activism and people that, that want to change systems, there's people like um, um, Mika White who, um, who co-founded the um, Occupy Wall Street movement. And even he said that activists have been, very have been very active and for decades have tried a lot of different tactics to shift on the course of government, but it hasn't really worked so far. And that's a really interesting thing about, um, about Gail Bradbrook from, um, from um, no, I don't know if the, um, the name blackout of the movement, um, Extinction Rebellion, which I think is more known in Europe as far as I know, but it's, a, it's another activist movement um, focused on climate change. And she actually had her main insights um, as part of a psychedelic um, experience, or a lot of her, her inspiration came from that, which shows, and Extinction Rebellion does have quite an, an impact so far, so it's an interesting thing to consider. Um, Looking at the time, I think I will jump these or just very briefly mention them. So we were also thinking about well, how, how does really psychoactivation work and how does it upgrade system change? And we came up with four essential blocks. So one is um, analyze. So um, like Stanislav Grof, Grof says that psychedelics are to the study of the mind where the telescope is for astronomy and the microscope is for biology. So you really understand what's going on in your mind. And then you have the bit of alleviation, which is all about shedding your old skins and letting go of, um, of conditioning and letting go of past trauma. And then the activation state, which is more about getting insights and downloads and um, getting inspiration through the psychedelic journey. And then there's the actualization, which is all about implementing that and integrating that in, in your actual life and work. 
Um, and yeah, the way how, how we currently set up SciX um, so far, and we're, um, we've been working on this since October last year, so we've already had some traction, but I mean, still are a young organization. But our focus is on research, media advocacy, and um, also on consulting. Um, we do have a podcast that people can check out um, as part of the media bit, and at the moment writing on several research proposals that focus at the intersection of um, psychedelic research and then also working with business schools and engineering departments of setting up research questions around how to upgrade innovation, how to, how to work with leaders in a way that really leverages the psychedelic experiences best. Um, on this one, just a quick note. So one thing that we find very important is to have a very systemic perspective on um, psychedelics and other psychoactive technologies. Uh, and that's why we see it really at, as nested dolls. So by tech, we mean the, the psychoactive technology. So that could be the psychedelic or the, the yogic practice. And it's also in our eyes very important to, um, to not forget about the cultural aspects and really, um, yeah, really pay contribution or um, be in respect of um, the shamans and the yogis and whoever is really closest to these technologies and who has, you know, sometimes hundreds or thousands of years of experience. And in that sense, it's somewhat <laughs> time-wise beyond the, the Western psychedelic movements. But then also to take into consideration the science and then um, the aspects that I mentioned, the leadership innovation and systems, and to see all that is, is nested in each other. And then one thing I wanted to mention very quickly is that we're currently working on a white paper together with One Heart, which is another great organization working with people in the entrepreneurship and leadership space. And they organize retreats in Costa Rica, especially for, for leaders and entrepreneurs. And the white paper is about the altered state of business. And we're looking at some um, key takeaways that people often get from a psychedelic journey and um, that change how they run their businesses. So that, um, for example, um, that it makes more sense to run an organization from a place of surrender and uh, rather than control and to see business as an infinite game and not a finite game and to, to, to go beyond competition and instead um, look at co-elevating each other. And yeah, I will leave it there. You can ex so the paper is not yet published, but um, I will post the link where you can sign up to get it sent to you once it's done. Um, and then I will hand over the mic to Niels, who will give um, a few minutes of um, insight on his own experience being a leader and getting insights through the psychedelic experience. Beautiful. Thank you, Tanya. So, hi guys. My name is Niels von Heine. Uh, some short background on, on who I am before I go into this story. Um, so, I'm, I'm, I'm a Swedish entrepreneur. Uh, I've been based in Stockholm and I've been spending my professional life in, in entrepreneurship. I come from a very scientific family and a very academic background. And throughout my almost 20 years now as an entrepreneur, my focus has primarily been focused on uh, disruptive tech and wherever society is changing the most. So I, I used to run what was the first, one of the first social media marketing agencies in Europe. Uh, I've started and ran companies within blockchain technology, VR, AR, uh, esports, uh, electrical vehicles, all sorts of things. And six years ago, my spiritual path and my path with psychoactivation tools, um, both uh, plant medicine, meditation, and breath work, uh, and yoga, and all sorts of other things began. Um, and it has been a journey that has literally taken me through these four steps that Tanya just referred to, these four eights of analyzing, uh, alleviating, activating and then actualizing. So um, concretely what that has meant is that my journey started with um, the focus of trying to understand myself. So the first couple of times I tried any type of psychedelics that became the focus and that was also the intention that I set for it. I wanted to understand myself and existence and the world around me. And as I got deeper into that practice I started setting new intentions, uh, which became more about what is my purpose, my path as a human being, what am I here to do, what are the things I'm supposed to be creating. And as I made that shift, uh, something also shifted in 
sort of the answers and insights and realizations I got when using these, these practices and these tools. So the way I see it, a human being tends to go through um, three sort of developmental phases over a lifetime, where the first one is, is usually externally focused. So we're born into this world and when we start getting conscious around what, what's actually going on here, we try to fit into the world. You know, how do I make friends? Who, what's my role in school, etc. All of these social games that, that we play. Uh, and eventually once you sort of figure that out, uh, and know how to function in this society and feel that you fit in. What tends to happen is, is you know, what people could refer to as you know, a midlife crisis, perhaps, <laughs> where you start questioning why you're doing things and you turn your focus inwards, which becomes more about, well, who am I actually? Uh, and why am I here? What am I supposed to do? And that it's only after that sort of phase where you can turn to fully being of service, uh, understanding it's not actually about me. I'm just a small part of a bigger whole, a bigger entity. Um, and I'm here to be of service for myself and the world at large. And, and obviously psychical activation tools can be very helpful on this journey and it has been for me. So I think the most concrete example I can bring is uh, roughly a year ago, I had my second ayahuasca journey uh, in the Brazilian jungles with the Brazilian shaman. And I clearly set the intention uh, path and purpose. I want to find out more about my path and purpose. And what, what ended up happening was that uh, that was the, the answers I was given by using these tools. So it was a combination of meditation, ayahuasca and, and breath work for, for six days. Um, and I basically got extremely specific downloads into what my path is, what I'm here to do, and also specific detailed projects. So the, I'm going to share a link here. Uh, since I won't go through the entire uh, project, but what came to me in this space was something called, or is something called World of Wisdom, which is basically taking a lot of the elements that already exist in the world today, uh, from um, participatory culture, Burning Man, uh, as an example, but then also the challenges that we, we have as, as humanity, these global challenges that we have upon us. And, and it merged these into a fairly simple and straightforward concept. So what World of Wisdom is, is uh, it's a global open source network of co-created gatherings that can happen offline or online, where people come together based on a set of shared principles. And the focus is to welcome and work on challenges, whether those challenges are personal, local, or global. And we do it using curiosity, playfulness, and, and co-creation. So the whole thing is structured in three simple layers. There's a foundational structure of uh, guiding principles that we can all gather around and this instruction for how to participate, which is basically bring your challenges, bring your gifts, um, bring a notebook, and then commit to acting up upon whatever you found at one of these gatherings. And then the second layer is open source. Anyone in the world can create one of these gatherings. And the third layer is digital, facilitating this, uh, making it easier for people to find and create these gatherings and, and find each other. Not really rocket science, but I was given this as a package um, straight from this ayahuasca journey. Uh, and that's a year ago. And I've been committing my life to this thing ever since and basically letting go of everything else. And my personal experience is that I am working 100% from truth now. So I've been partly true for most of my career, but now I'm fully true. And, and these tools have helped me do this. And also by setting the intention and by collaborating with others in this uh, experience, we can move from just the personal inner healing and understanding of myself to actually, just like Tanya referred to, manifesting new structures, new things to do, new, new patterns into the world. And, and, and like that, we can actually start being of service using the, the skills that we have. I think those are my short five minutes. Um, but um, well, if you're interested, feel free to reach out to me. I'm also part of, of SciEx and the SciEx organization. And feel free to check out uh, uh, World of Wisdom. Uh, and what I do now is I continuously work with these tools as a tool for innovation, as a tool to guide my own leadership when I lead these, um, 
various organizations that I'm part of, um, and primarily as a tool to allow me to connect with new thought patterns in the systemic change that the world needs. And so many of us are now committed to actually, you know, making come to life. Thank you. I'll hand it back to you, Tanya, from there. Yeah, I'm not sure um, if we still have time for questions. Um, maybe Marik. Yeah, just jumping on. Thank you both for uh, such a great talk. Um, we do have one question from the audience. Uh, so how do you envision the convergence between the psychedelic renaissance and the future of work, uh, say in the next 10 years of time? Um, yeah, I mean, maybe um, I share a little bit and you can jump in. Um, I find it a great question. I think what's, what might happen is that um, it actually reminds me of a quote um, from a, um, a short story called um, Pala from North Star and the Orient Project, um, which is about, it's essentially a short story of how psychedelic business can go wrong. And in the end, they have a closing, um, a closing remark, which is we don't need more psychedelic businesses, but we need more psychedelic business models um, for organizations along those lines, uh, not 100% the same wording, but the point of psychedelic business models really struck me when I read this. And I think um, the kind of insights that I get through psychedelic journeys is that it's a lot about, um, yeah, just like taking the, the insights from psychedelics to the way how you run organizations. And I think that's very much aligned with, um, aligned with a lot of the the latest trends in organizational development, which, you know, is for example, decentralization, um, less hierarchies, empowerment of all the people in the organization. So I think that's, you know, I think it just kind of says the same thing. So I think, um, yeah, I see total conversion. <laughs> yeah, and if I can add to that, then um, an organization consists of human beings, mostly. We, we do have AIs and robots and stuff coming in. <laughs> but for the time being, it's mostly uh, human beings. And as a human being, we basically only do th three things on this earth um, uh, as a journey. So everything is exploration and experience that what we do. Um, but it's three steps in terms of, of becoming a whole self. The first is, is healing wounds. And those could be internal. It could be to other people and, and those connections. The other is aligning with our purpose, understanding what it is, and then manifesting it as sort of gifts to the world. And the third is, is to act, act from our power in every moment and being of service to ourselves and the world at large. And the way I see this development of, of the psychedelic renaissance and, and, and then merging that into work life is quite simply that we're at a point where we've primarily been using these tools for the personal uh, perspective uh, on things. And as we get more acquainted with it, as it gets more mainstream and, and accepted into modern society, we will naturally start shifting our focus to the systems which is the same if you look at how we've been using the internet for instance uh, any times any type of technology when it comes we start acting with it very personally and almost like a child you know uh, you just look at vr what, what what does a person do when you try vr for the first time well you're amazed they can pick things up and then you can throw them it's like a two-year-old behavior same thing with social media. Um, and then we grow up with these technologies and we start to understand, well, we can use this as a work tool. We can use this as a tool for systemic and societal change. So uh, I see it also as a natural way it will merge into work life where it will be fully accepted to use these tools to work on yourself. But just like you can heal an individual and align with your personal purpose and then act from your power, an organization can do the same. What are the organiza organizational wounds we might have to heal? How can we as a workplace fully align with our purpose, understanding why we're doing this thing? Why are we creating this company or this organization? And then how do we act in the service of both the organization and the world at large in, in everything we do? So those are my 10 cents on the topic. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, well, thank you so much, Tanya and Niels. We really appreciated you joining us. And um, yeah, excited to continue the conversation offline. Mm, yeah, thank you very much for having us. <laughs> Be well, guys. Bye-bye.